Hello everyone. Today we will be reviewing the first part of chapter 7 and going over learning. So learning is a collection of different techniques, procedures, and outcomes that produce change in an organism's behavior. The broad definition of learning is the acquisition of new knowledge, skills, or responses from experience that result in a relatively permanent change in the state of the learner. And the study of the learning process known as classical conditioning began with Pavlov's dogs. And so um, Ivan Pavlov initially was studying the digestion of dogs in 1927 when he observed that the dogs would start to salivate at the sight of the researcher coming into the room whether they had food with them or not. Much like if you would walk towards where you kept your dog's food, your dog may start to wag his tail or jump up and down. Pavlov took his observations further and started pairing or ringing a bell every time he presented food to the dogs. After repeated trials of pairing the bell with the presentation of food, he found that if he only rang the bell without presenting food, the dogs would start to salivate. Using the example of Pavlov's dogs, I will now explain classical conditioning terms. The first one is the unconditioned stimulus, and this is something that reliably produces a naturally occurring reaction in an organism. So in our example, the dog's food is the unconditioned stimulus because food causes a natural reaction in the dogs. And an unconditioned response is a reflexive reaction that is reliably produced by an unconditioned stimulus, such as a dog salivating um, response to the presentation of the food. So the stimulus is the food and the naturally occurring response is the dog's salivation. And so the neutral stimulus is a stimulus that does not produce a reliable response such as the bell. The bell, before being paired with the food, typically does not produce any response from a dog or from Pavlov's dogs. The conditioned stimulus is a stimulus that is initially neutral and produces no reliable change or response in an organism. So after pairing the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, it then becomes a conditioned stimulus. So the bell, which is initially the neutral stimulus, is paired with the presentation of the food over and over again by presenting the food with the ringing of a bell. After several pairings or presenting the food with the ringing of the bell, the dog will be conditioned to respond with just the presentation of the bell alone. And so the conditioned response now is a reaction that resembles an unconditioned response but is now produced by conditioned stimulus. So we here have the dog drooling or salivating and what the definition is basically telling us is that initially the dog drooled when he was presented the food, but now when he hears the ringing of the bell, um, he now drools just at that, uh, the tone of the bell. So next we'll see an illustration of this process. So here we see before conditioning or pairing the food with the bell, our dog Spike here salivates at the sight of food. So food is the unconditioned stimulus that causes an unconditioned response, salivating. When we ring a bell, the neutral stimulus, nothing happens. Spike just looks at us wondering what we're doing ringing this handbell. And when we are conditioning and pairing the bell with the food over many trials, say every time you feed him, so two times a day for 10 days straight, Spike learns that when you ring the bell, you're going to bring him food. And so he automatically starts to drool. And after those trials of pairings, of the food and the bell, every time you ring the bell, he automatically starts to drool, even if you present the food or not. 
So same thing happens if you even walk towards his leash because he has learned that when you go for that leash, you're going to take him for a walk. So these are just simple observations that you may have made uh, when you're getting ready to feed your dog or when you are getting ready to take him out on a walk. So now that we have a good grasp on the understanding of the process of conditioning, we can now understand the definition of classical conditioning. So it's important for you guys to get a good grasp on this process and these terms because the chapter builds on your understanding of these concepts. So as the definition explains, the bell produces a response from the dog, he salivates, after being paired with food, which naturally causes this response. And when we discuss responses to stimuli, whether it's the food or a bell, these responses are reflexive. So they're um, naturally occurring and these involve physiological responding like the salivating. So another important consideration to classical conditioning which affects the ability to create a response and ultimately conditioning is the timing of the stimuli presentation. So the timing of that presentation of food or the bell. So for example, if we're trying to get a salivary response from Spike by presenting him with food and ringing the bell, if he's not hungry, and we just fed him earlier, the conditioning and response that we want are not going to happen. So this consideration is necessary for conditioning. And what's also necessary for, get, uh, for conditioning are the following principles. The first principle discussed is acquisition. So acquisition is the phase of classical conditioning when the conditioned stimulus, the bell, and the unconditioned stimulus, the food, are paired over and over again. If you think about the meaning of the word acquisition, acquisition simply means that you are acquiring or learning, obtaining something. So the acquisition phase of classical conditioning is where Spike is learning the pairing of the food and the ringing of the bell. So during this phase, there are certain ground rules that are necessary for successful conditioning. So these include the stimuli must be paired in close proximity to one another, meaning that right after you ring the bell, you must present the food, not 10 minutes later. Um, second, learning is gradual, and as such, multiple pairings or trials are necessary for learning. So you can't just pair the bell with the presentation of food one time and expect our dog Spike to learn this um, association. So the next principle of classical conditioning involves second order conditioning. And this is conditioning where the unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus that acquired its ab ability to produce learning from an earlier procedure in which it was used as a conditioned stimulus. So money would be a good example of second order conditioning. Dollar bills are just, if we think about it, they're really just a piece of paper, but through classical conditioning, we learn that money can be used to purchase my favorite things, which are clothes and shoes. Uh, we learn that money will bring happiness through purchasing these material objects. So through money, or though money is not directly associated with our feelings of happiness, through second order conditioning, we automatically link money with happiness or security. Extinction. So extinction is the gradual elimination of this learned response that occurs when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented. So after we quit uh, quit pairing the food with the ringing of the bell, Spike will quit salivating at the sound of the bell after a while because he learns that when you ring the bell, you're not going to feed him. And so this is where we see extinction. The next principle that we have is spontaneous recovery. So spontaneous recovery is the tendency of a learned behavior to recover from extinction after a rest period where you're not feeding him or presenting the bell for the sake of our example. 
So an example of this includes Pavlov extinguishing the conditioned response, the salivating, and allowing his dogs to have a short resting period. When he brought them back into the lab and presented them with the conditioned stimulus, the bell, again, they demonstrated spontaneous recovery and they started salivating at the sound of that bell. So here we have a great illustration of these principles. After several trials pairing the conditioned stimulus, the bell, with the unconditioned stimulus, the food, the conditioned stimulus alone comes to elicit that salivary response, which is the conditioned response. So this acquisition where Spike learns when we ring a bell, we're going to feed him. So what we also see is that learning tends to take place fairly rapidly and then levels off um, as stable responding starts to develop. So here we see a rapid incline of learning and then it's slowly starting to stable off. <clears throat> In extinction, the conditioned response of salivating diminishes rapidly until it no longer occurs. So the drops of saliva that's elicited by the bell starts to go down after we stop pairing it with the food. <clears throat> so next we see a 24 hour rest period where nothing happens. You're not feeding him, <clears throat> you're not presenting the bell with the food, um, you're not doing any anything. So following this rest period, you will observe a spontaneous recovery of this condition response, the salivating, if you ring the bell. A well-learned condition response may show spontaneous recovery after more than one rest period without the addition of repeated learning trials after extinction, as we see on the right of this illustration. So uh, we see a spontaneous recovery, but it's not as strong as the first spontaneous recovery. Continuing on with the principles of classical conditionings, we have generalization. So generalization is the process by which the condition response, the drooling, is observed even though the condition stimulus, the bell, is slightly different from the original one that was used during acquisition. So this would be an, an example of this would be if we use a whistle instead of a bell. In Spike, if he has generalized the bell to any loud tone such as a whistle, he may also respond to a whistle by drooling, but not as much as he would as if we presented a bell. In generalization, there are two things happening that are important to consider. So by responding, the organism demonstrates that it recognizes the similarity between the original condition stimulus, which is the bell, and the new stimulus, which is the whistle. Secondly, by displaying a diminished response where he's not drooling as much, it's demonstrating that he recognizes the difference between the two stimuli. And so the second principle that's presented on the slide is discrimination. And discrimination is whereby Spike has the capacity to distinguish between similar but distinct stimuli. So this is where he's able to distinguish or discriminate a bell from a whistle. And so that wraps up our first part of chapter 7.